Have you ever wondered what would happen if you took the most terrifying survival horror game ever made and dropped a superhero into it? We're driving up to Mount Massive Asylum today, but we aren't bringing a camera and a bag of AA batteries. We're bringing the Dark Knight. Here's the setup. Bruce Wayne arrives with his standard tactical suit, utility belt, and peak physical conditioning. But there's a catch. No Batmobile tanking the front gate, no Alfred whispering advice in his ear, he's completely on his own. The inmates inside aren't your typical Gotham thugs. They are chemically altered, pain-resistant monsters. So looking at the physics and the biology, the question isn't just, can he survive? It's, how fast does he take over? Let's break down the science of Batman versus the morphogenic engine. The game starts with an infiltration. You probably remember playing as journalist Miles Upshur, shimmying through a bathroom window because you can't break a lock. For Batman, obviously, getting in is trivial. But the first massive difference you'd notice is the vision mechanics. Outlast is famous for that green night vision mode, right? Miles relies on a handheld camcorder that drains batteries every few minutes. When those batteries die, you are effectively blind. Now compare that to the cowl. Batman's vision operates on a completely different level of physics. It uses solid state image intensification layered with thermal imaging. He doesn't need to scavenge for batteries in dark corners. His suit is powered by a micro turbine that can run for weeks. Think about the noise factor too. While Miles is hyperventilating and creating noise at around 30 to 40 decibels just by breathing, Batman utilizes Pranabindu breathing techniques. He can voluntarily drop his heart rate to near hibernation levels, roughly 40 beats per minute, effectively silencing his own biology. Let's look at the physics of sound in the asylum. Sound intensity follows the inverse square law. If you step on broken glass, which is everywhere in this game, that 70 decibel crunch alerts every variant within a 50 foot radius. Normal walking generates a ground reaction force of about 1.2 times your body weight. But Batman's boots? They're lined with sound dampening metamaterials that absorb the impact energy. He could sprint down the administration hallway and produce less acoustic energy than Miles does while crouching. Then you encounter the twins. You know the ones, the two naked silent variants with machetes. For Miles, this is a death sentence because he has zero combat training. For Batman, this is just a simple physics equation. He doesn't need to run away. To incapacitate a human target silently, you need to restrict blood flow to the brain. Specifically, you need to apply about 4.4 pounds per square inch psi of pressure to the carotid arteries. If Batman applies a rear naked choke, he cuts off that flow, inducing unconsciousness in just 8 to 10 seconds. The twins have reached with those machetes, sure, but their swing speed is average for a heavy adult male. Batman operates at a reaction time of roughly 0.15 seconds, twice as fast as the average human. He slips the swing, applies the torque, and drops the body before the second twin even realizes what happened. And consider the hide and locker mechanic. That's the core loop of Outlast, right? You see a monster, you hide in a box, and you pray. Batman would never do this. Psychologically, hiding puts you in a passive, high cortisol state. Batman uses active stealth. He utilizes the verticality of the room, grappling to the rafters or perching on high shelves. He turns the environment against the variants. When a variant checks the locker, he finds nothing, because the predator is already hanging from the ceiling behind him. Finally, think about the jump scares. The library chase is terrifying because Miles has zero offensive capability. His amygdala, the brain's fear center, is firing constantly. Batman has undergone conditioning to suppress that panic reflex. When a corpse swings out of a doorway, his heart rate doesn't spike, his tactical assessment engages. The variants in the administration block rely on intimidation. Against a master of ninjutsu who carries smoke pellets and operates in total silence, they are completely outclassed. So how does this phase rank? He clears the administration block in the library without ever being seen, turning a survival horror game into a stealth action tutorial. For the first chapter of the game, we are giving Batman a survival tier, S. As you push deeper into the asylum, the difficulty curve spikes vertically. You aren't dealing with skinny, malnourished patients anymore. You're dealing with Chris Walker. You know, the guy, the massive, chemically altered ex-soldier who patrols the corridors with those heavy, deliberate footsteps. In the game, Walker is an instant game over for Miles Upshur. If he catches you, you die. But for Batman, Walker represents a familiar archetype, the Brew. Think Bane or Killer Croc or Solomon Grundy. However, we need to respect the physics of this enemy because Walker isn't just big, he possesses strength that borders on the superhuman. Let's break down the science of his signature kill move, ripping a human's head straight off the body. It's gruesome, sure, but look at the biomechanics. The cervical spine is surprisingly resilient. To actually separate the head from the body using just brute force, you have to tear through the trapezius muscles, snap the spinal ligaments, and shatter the C1 and C2 vertebrae. 
Forensic biomechanics suggests this requires approximately 1,000 to 1,200 pounds of tensile force. That is roughly 5,000 newtons of output. For context, imagine having a grand piano suspended entirely from your neck. Walker generates this force casually, with one hand. If he grabs Batman, even the Dark Knight is in serious trouble. So the big question is, can Batman tank a hit from the sky? Miles is running around in jeans and a t-shirt, which offers zero impact attenuation. Batman, on the other hand, is wearing a tri-weave bodysuit consisting of an outer Kevlar layer, reinforced with titanium dip fibers. This armor is designed specifically to disperse kinetic energy. If Walker lands a punch delivering 5,000 newtons, the suit spreads that force across the entire chest plate, rather than a single point of impact. It turns a lethal bone-shattering blow into a severe concussion of the chest wall. It would hurt, absolutely, and it might even crack a rib, but it wouldn't kill him instantly like it does Miles. But let's be real, Batman wouldn't trade punches with a tank if he didn't have to. He would exploit the physics of mass and inertia. Walker is massive, likely weighing over 350 pounds. According to Newton's first law, an object with that much mass has tremendous inertia. It resists changes in motion. Walker has a high top speed in a straight line, but his acceleration and turning radius are terrible. In a close quarters engagement, Batman is effectively moving twice as fast as Walker can process visual information. He would use Walker's own momentum against him, dodging the charge and striking the vulnerable joints, the knees and ankles, which are already under stress supporting that massive frame. The biggest difference, however, is verticality. Miles Upshur is groundbound. He can only run flat. Batman thinks in three dimensions. The moment Walker appears, Batman would grapple to the ceiling pipes or vault over a security gate. Walker, with his immense bulk, simply cannot climb effectively. He is a two-dimensional predator stuck in a three-dimensional trap. Batman would likely drop from the shadows utilizing a glide kick to deliver maximum kinetic energy to Walker's skull, knocking him out cold. However, even with all that advantage, the sheer damage potential of Walker means one mistake could be fatal. He isn't a stealth takedown, he's a boss fight. Because of that risk factor, we have to drop the rating slightly from the first section. For the encounter with Chris Walker, we are assigning a survival tier A. After escaping the brute force physics of Chris Walker, the threat profile shifts dramatically. You aren't dealing with a tank anymore, you're dealing with surgical precision. This is where you enter the male ward and encounter Dr. Rick Traeger. In the game, this is a scripted capture sequence that everyone remembers. Miles Upshur gets knocked out, strapped to a wheelchair, and pushed into a makeshift operating room. Then, in a moment of pure helplessness, Traeger, a former business executive turned maniac, surgically removes two of Miles' fingers with a pair of rusty bone shears. It's terrifying because Miles has no agency. But if you put Batman in that chair, you change the physiological equation entirely. Let's assume Batman gets captured. Maybe he's gassed or overwhelmed by sheer numbers, which does happen in the comics occasionally. He wakes up restrained with heavy leather cuffs. For Miles, this is an impossible situation because he lacks the anatomical knowledge to escape. For Batman, this is just a geometry problem. The human hand is held together by a complex network of ligaments. To escape a tight cuff without a key, you don't need to pull against the leather. You have to alter the actual structure of your hand. Batman has trained to voluntarily dislocate the carpal metacarpal joint at the base of the thumb. By collapsing the thumb inward against the palm and relaxing the adductor pollicis muscle, he can reduce the width of his hand by approximately 20%. Now, make no mistake, this process is excruciating. It fires high threshold nociceptors, your body's pain receptors, straight to the brain. An average person like Miles would likely go into neurogenic shock, causing his blood pressure to plummet and rendering him useless. Batman, however, utilizes a technique known as pain compartmentalization. He acknowledges the signal, but refuses to react to it. In the three seconds it takes Trigger to pick up his shears, Batman has already slipped the cuff. Trigger turns around expecting a victim, and instead finds a free combatant. And let's be honest about the matchup. Trigger is a skinny, middle-aged man armed with a melee weapon. Against a master martial artist, he has zero win condition. Batman disarms him, likely breaking the doctor's wrist in the process, and ends the surgery before it begins. However, Traeger is just a symptom. The disease is the morphogenic engine. Throughout the asylum, a broadcast signal is rewriting the neural pathways of everyone inside. This is the Wall Rider project, using visual and auditory frequencies to induce a state of lucid dreaming while the subject is awake. It forces the brain's neuroplasticity into overdrive, breaking down the barrier between reality and hallucination. This is why the inmates are insane. Their brains are effectively being boiled in a microwave of psychic data. Miles Upshur slowly loses his mind as he documents the horror, his sanity slipping until he becomes a host. Could Batman withstand this? We have to look at his exposure history. 
Bruce Wayne has been subjected to Jonathan Crane's fear toxin dozens of times. That toxin chemically stimulates the amygdala to produce maximum terror. Batman has developed a psychological antibody to induced insanity. He practices Tibetan Tumo meditation, which allows him to control his brainwave states, keeping his mind focused in an alpha or theta state even under extreme stress. Furthermore, comic lore establishes that Batman has a backup personality buried deep in his psyche, sometimes referred to as the Batman of Zero and R. If the morphogenic engine attempts to break Bruce Wayne's mind, it encounters a mental firewall designed specifically to function during a total psychological collapse. The engine relies on the subject's fear and trauma to work, but Batman's trauma is the fuel for his discipline. The signal doesn't break him, it just makes him more focused. So while the physical threat of Trigger is negligible, the constant mental assault of the engine forces Batman to actively defend his own sanity. It's a battle, but one he's uniquely equipped to win. Because of that mental strain, we're keeping this at a survival tier A. You finally reach the underground lab. This is where the genre shifts from survival horror to science fiction. You aren't hiding from maniacs anymore, you are facing the wall rider. In the game, this looks like a ghost, but documents reveal it as a swarm of nanites, microscopic machines controlled by the mind of a comatose patient, Billy Hope. This is the only enemy Batman cannot defeat with martial arts. You can't punch a cloud. If you apply 3000 newtons of force to a swarm of nanobots, the energy dissipates through the empty space. It's a fundamental physics impossibility. Furthermore, the wall rider destroys its victims on a cellular level, forcing its way into the body to tear tissue apart from the inside. Miles has absolutely no physical defense against this kind of intrusion. Batman's suit is hermetically sealed against chemical agents, which might offer seconds of protection against intrusion, but he can't tank this damage. However, this is where the world's greatest detective title matters more than the fists. Miles Upshur stumbles through the lab reading random folders to piece the puzzle together, Batman would treat this as a crime scene. He scans the environment, correlates the heavy machinery cabling, and deduces that the ghost is a projection tethered to a physical host. He identifies Billy Hope as the anchor point within minutes, referencing schematics he likely memorized before entering. He doesn't need to run aimlessly, he goes straight for the source. Now, we have to talk about the utility belt. If Batman is carrying his standard loadout, this fight is over in seconds. Nanites are fundamentally electronic. They rely on electromagnetic fields to coordinate their swarm behavior. Batman carries localized EMP emitters in his cowl and belt. One high-frequency burst would disrupt the magnetic cohesion of the nanite cloud, dropping the wall rider instantly. But let's play hard mode and assume his gadgets are broken or depleted. He has to kill the life support manually. The final sequence of Outlast is a desperate sprint while the wall rider chases you. Miles is panting, stumbling, his VO2 max hitting its absolute limit as lactic acid floods his muscles. Batman has the cardiovascular endurance of an Olympic marathon runner combined with the burst speed of a sprinter. He doesn't stumble, and he doesn't slow down. He outpaces the swarm, reaches the pod, and disconnects Billy Hope before the nanites can catch him. Then comes the ending. Miles walks out and gets shot to death by a Murkoff tactical team. This is the final lethal variable. A squad of soldiers trained to shoot a terrified journalist is not prepared for a stealth predator. The soldiers are carrying automatic rifles with a cyclic rate of 700 rounds per minute. Miles simply can't dodge that volume of fire. Batman, however, moves faster than their target acquisition allows. When the soldiers arrive, Miles raises his hands. Batman drops a smoke pellet. The soldiers rely on laser sight and night vision. But Batman utilizes thermal imaging. He sees them long before they see him. He breaks their formation, using fear as a weapon just as effectively as the Asylum did. He utilizes the seam from the lab pipes for cover, disables their firearms with batarangs, and neutralizes the squad using non-lethal takedowns. He doesn't die in the doorway, he walks out with the evidence. Because the Wall Rider ignores physical durability and requires specific tech or deduction to defeat, this is the only part of the night that poses a genuine existential threat to the bat. For the underground lab, we're giving him a survival tier B. Ultimately, Mount Massive Asylum is a playground for the Dark Knight. The physical threats, the variants, Chris Walker, the twins, are well within his combat tier. The only true danger is the morphogenic engine assault on the mind, but Bruce Wayne's mental conditioning is the perfect shield. He doesn't just survive, he shuts Murkoff down completely. If you want to see if his sanity holds up in the fog of Silent Hill, make sure to hit that subscribe button.